training, we are going to talk about derp duty weapon accessories. I recently got sent a message from somebody on Instagram where they had found a picture of a guy who was a cop, took a picture of his plate carrier with a tourniquet and his Glock 19 with a light and a little finger attachment for his light and a comp on it sitting on top of his vest. And I used that, well, I played with it and used it as the thumbnail so that you guys could see what it is exactly I'm talking about when I say derp duty weapon accessories. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Before we get into the meat of the topic, I want to thank, I got three new Patreons this week. Uh, Zwayne Makita came on Patreon, uh, Matthew Speedle, and Garen Shermerian. Shamarian? I'm sorry, I'm probably not saying those right. But thanks a lot for coming on by. I've just been doing a bunch of Patreon live streams recently about uh, getting a car. My old car, as you can see, this is a different car. It's significantly smaller than the one I had before. My old car went to the big wrecking, scar and wrecking yard in the sky, and I had to do something uh, to fix the situation of me getting to work. So check those out. It's uh, some cool stuff up there on Patreon. Plus, I've got things up there that have been up there for a month that haven't been released on YouTube yet. So it's interesting. Uh, also, check out freefieldtrainingpodcast.com. There's a link down in the description for all this stuff. I just put up on freefieldtrainingpodcast.com the perspective review of Code of Silence. We did a little crossover with another podcast called whatcopswatch.com. I was on whatcopswatch.com doing their review of Code of Silence, which is a, an 80s cop movie set in Chicago. It was really cool to do with them. So go check that out, too. All right, so now on to the meat of the topic. On Instagram, especially on Instagram, it seems, people do things just to look cool. And I'm totally all right with people doing things just to look cool. Totally all right with it. If you got a Jeep and you've got lights all over the outside of it and a big winch on the front and big mutter tires and you use it off-road, that's great, right? But don't tell me that you see better on the highway with all the lights because you can't have mud. Right? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to say that. You do it for off-roading. And some people do that just for the Instagram. I'm sure you've seen those before. Drives my buddy Thorpe, that one Jeep over on Instagram, drives him nuts that people do that. They build up a Jeep. They don't ever take it off-roading. They just build cool stuff on it. But if that's what you're into, that's cool. Now, the same thing with duty weapons, except not if it's your duty weapon. If you want to buy a you know, Glock 17 or Glock 19 to put a comp on it and a light and a little finger pad thing on your middle finger so you can do it and put a little RMR on top of it and then paint the whole thing gold or red camouflage and put a special end plate on it with a you know skull, Punisher skull or whatever, that's great. For Instagram, you want to, oh, this is so cool. Look at this cool little project I did. That's awesome. Here's the problem with the picture that we have up on the thumbnail. The guy who posted that was showing that that's what he uses for work, or at least he was implying that that's what he uses for work, because directly above where the pistol and the tourniquet are was his agency name, and it was a federal agency. Hopefully that's not what he's using for work. Here's the problem with that pistol. The comp, arguable. Completely arguable. For a while, duty lights were arguable. Not so much anymore. You're pretty solid with that. And he had a Surefire, I think, on there. Pretty solid. But the little finger pad, if you look on that picture, you get the grip of the gun, where your trigger finger's at, and then there's a pad that's underneath the trigger guard. So when you grab a hold of the gun and you squeeze with your middle finger to turn that light on, the light, it activates a switch. So when you squeeze the grip, it automatically activates the switch to turn the light on. So this means one of two things. Either this guy always has the light on when he has his gun in his hand, which is dumb, or he's turning it on and off using that pressure switch. Now look at my fingers. If I'm turning it on and off with this finger, go go ahead and try it. Put your hand out like you're, you're holding the gun and move just your middle finger and see what your trigger finger does. Can we see where the problem might result in having a pressure pad attached to where this middle finger's at and activating the pressure pad with your middle finger on your duty pistol. 
things happen in real life. And we don't want to be turning the light on and getting a bang instead. And this is me sitting in my car with the engine running, the air conditioning lightly blowing on me, talking to all of you, and my fingers moving. Imagine under stress, I'm death gripping that pistol, but I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to grip the light. So I shut the light off and I turn the light on to see who that is. Mm, bang! And this is the dumb stuff that I see on Instagram all the time. And unfortunately, every once in a while, I see in real life. We've talked about security guards doing weird things, carrying, you know, Taurus Judge, like little shotgun shell revolvers and stuff like that. This is something every once in a while we see a cop doing. Being on the forefront of technology, the latest and greatest, that's one thing. But being stupid, just using things because you don't understand how human physiology works, because apparently you missed every firearms class ever and every taser class ever where they say, don't use your gun and your taser at the same time. And you only do one thing with one hand at one time. So the reason that weapon lights, when we put them on a duty gun, we don't put a little pressure pad on it to our middle finger, is that you're supposed to use your support hand to operate the switch. Now watch, I can put my trigger finger straight out and I can operate the switch all I want with my support hand and it has no reaction in this other hand. That's why we do it that way. And those little pressure pad switches, you're putting that on your gun thinking, oh, this is the new latest and greatest thing. Look what I found. Those have been around for at least 15 years that I'm aware of. That's not new technology. And there's a reason that no one else uses it. There's lots of stuff like that. But that's the one that jumped out at me because it's dumb to write, come get some on the side of your duty weapon. And I hope everyone knows that. And it's dumb to put Punisher skulls on it. And it's dumb to put it in a very bad holster. It's dumb to buy your duty weapon used, like well used, you know, to, or to not take care of it when it has problems. It's dumb to do all those things, but man, you do not, like the little middle finger switch, that is stupid. That is epically stupid, and whoever's doing that, I hope they're making a joke on Instagram. Like, huh, look, this is my duty weapon I got. I comped a Glock 19 and cut down the grip a little bit, and I put a light on it, and I put a little pressure switch, so I only need one hand to turn my light on. He, you know that guy's got to be turning the gun sideways, shooting it. I certainly hope that's a joke, or that's his, like, fun gun or competition gun or something like that, and that's not actually what he's using at work. Because you get somebody, one, you get somebody seriously hurt, like killed, seriously hurt, and two... You are way open to civil liability as a cop. You put something like that on your gun. And whose agency administrators and armorers and instructors are allowing this type of stuff? At the federal level? No. All right. So we're going to scroll up to the top and we're going to take some of the comments here on the YouTube live stream. Carlos Maxilino Rodriguez Gonzalez says, hello. Hello, and we're going to skip all the other hello and highs. Hello and hi to all of you. Thank you for stopping by. Jacob Roy says, just run stock Glock 21. Uh, buddy of mine, Chris. Chris is the instructor that you saw on the stat medical gear for the school video. What did I name it? I think I named it Stop the Bleed Training for Teachers. Look at that video. Bearded guy. He's not my brother. <laughs> He's not my brother. We look kind of alike, but he's not my brother. I've known him a long time, though, probably 15, 20 years. When he was a cop, he ran a stock Glock 21. In fact, he had the stock plastic non-night U-notch sights, and he said, never caused him any problems. He loved that gun. Ben TV says, signing in from Melbourne, Australia. Hello from Illinois. George Hedez says, how tall are you? I am five foot two inches tall. That's like one of the biggest questions that I get on the channel. I'm five foot two inches tall, and that's why I am perfectly comfortable sitting in a Toyota Corolla I am. <laughs> and I can fit my whole family in here because we're all little. My wife's only like five one. My kids are in like the single percentile for height and weight. So even with me sitting here, there's still plenty of room for my kids in the back with the car seats. We got lots of space in here. Not as much space as the Ford 500 had, but I'm doing all right. It's a little tight with my duty belt on in this seat, 
but that's just driving back and forth to work, so I'll live with it. I'll live with it to not have a big car payment, which is nice. Matt Doherty says, how are the roads? I'm north of you in Michigan. It's just it's just raining a little bit here, so they're a little wet. But other than that, they're not they're not bad at all. The roads are they're a little wet. It's just kind of like pitter pattering on us. We're not getting snow or ice or anything, at least not yet. Jacob eight six nine six says, Tommy, I recently come across your channel. I'm a full time firefighter and a reserve deputy. Just want to say your videos have given me some great knowledge. Hey, I'm I'm glad they help. If they help you, please share them with other people that are in similar circumstances as you. I know reserve departments, reserve deputies, reserve officers don't always get the training and experience that they should, or sometimes even that the law requires. And if my videos are not designed at all to be a replacement for formal training or for the academy or any of that, I don't call it free field academy. I don't call it free academy. I call it free field training. It's just supposed to be tips and tricks for you to get a little better at the job. So if they help you, please share them with other people you think they will help. Mr. Doverfield says, duty weapons are serious business. They are. It Kind of like police cars. And here's where I make the, the split with it. Cool stuff's great. You got a gun you're going to take, you're, it's a race gun. You're going to use a CZ-75, you're going to comp it. You know, you're going to cut springs off of it, use lighter 9mm, you're going to soup up the 9mm, make major, or whatever you're going to do with it. You're going to put a, a light and an optic and, you know, pressure pads and a, a thumb push pusher thing so that you can you can hold on to the gun better and push forward so you get rid of recoil control and all of that that's great for a race gun just like if you're going to take a corvette and you're going to supercharge it you're going to put dual superchargers on it and you're going to change the gearing and you put a short shifter in it and all of that stuff that's that's great for racing but for police work we don't use corvettes with superchargers on them and for a very good reason we don't change the brakes out on the squad cars to something that's not a stock brake system. And there's a very good reason. The car is designed to work the way it works. It's designed by engineers that wake way more than I could ever make in my entire life, probably way more than all of you make combined, to figure out exactly the best way for that car to work, for it to be balanced, for it to brake, for it to accelerate. You start screwing with that, you start causing problems, you start causing accidents even stupid, simple modifications. So we don't do that to squad cars. At least, no smart agency administrators do that to squad cars. The same thing with duty weapons. You get the gun, mount a light on it. Maybe change the sights. That's about it. You don't start dicking around with pressure switches and stuff that breaks and putting all sorts of garbage on it and spray painting it and changing the internals. I had a guy one time came, he had titanium safety mechanisms inside his Glock. I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, it changes the lock. It, it speeds up the lock time. Do you know what lock time is? That is inconsequential to the totality of how a duty weapon works. The lock time? That's something you worry about on a Remington 700 with a 10 power scope that you're shooting at 300 yards. Not a Glock 19. <laughs> lock time does not matter. Plus, those parts break. They're not in spec. The size might be in spec, but the weight isn't in spec. It's not working the way the engineer designed it to work. So yeah, it's very serious. You should use the stock gun or as close to the stock gun as you can get. There are some things that you can change that have no effect on the liability involved with it because they have no effect on the trigger mechanism. They have no effect on how well the gun works. Those are great. You want to put a light on it. You want to put night sights on it. I'd, I'd even go red dots these days. Some people say, oh, red dots are good. Some say red dots are bad. You shouldn't use it for a duty weapon. I'm still up in the air on that, but... You don't want to go screwing around with the internals and putting race modifications on it, because that's not good. And you don't want pressure switches for lights or lasers or any of that. Especially if they're middle finger. Middle finger? Directly under your trigger finger? Bad news. Kyle Radigan says, didn't see the thumbnail. It's up there. The thumbnail's up there. I'm going to post it on Instagram and Facebook with the link to this video anyway too. So you'll see it around. It's just a Glock 19. It's got a comp on it. I think they changed the sights on it a little bit, like textured it, cut the grip off, and put a surefire light on it with like a little pressure pad to the mid where the middle finger's at. You'll see it. it. It's up there. It'll stay up there. And I'll put the pictures up on, on the other social media that I do, Instagram, Facebook, stuff like that. 
Dan. Hello, Dan. Says, finally caught a live stream. Good morning from Southern California. Good morning from Illinois. Hopefully it is nicer out in Southern California. Here it is very wet and rainy. Jeremy Wang says, hello from Pittsburgh. You ought to do a video on shotguns. We are going to, it's not quite warm enough for that yet. Plus my brother's getting married and he's kind of got his backyard set up for getting married instead of as a, as a shooting range like we had before with the, the vest videos. But when we get back into the swing of doing stuff outdoors, uh, I've got videos coming up that are planned about uh, selecting ammunition for a duty shotgun because a lot of people have asked me about that. And it's one of those things that's better shown. Like you just talk about it on a live stream, but it's better shown than me just talking about it. John Smith says, over-accessorizing your weapon displays fear in the user's competency, in my opinion. It can. Some people just want every advantage they can possibly get. But I think a lot of them don't realize that they're not getting an advantage. There's no advantage to doing what you're doing. There's lots of disadvantages to doing it. And there's techniques to get around the issues that they're buying accessories for. We get a lot of new guys... And I'm not saying this is why everyone uses earpieces, but we get a lot of new guys that have earpieces. I had one when I was new too. And here's what causes brand new guys to get the earpiece thing. There's a radio in the car. The agency they work for has a radio in the car that's the same as the radio that's on their vest or on their belt. And if you leave the radio on your belt or your vest up and you key up the car radio that's on the same freak, you get what? So the solution for every new guy in the world is to get the little earpiece thing. Problem is, not all the little earpiece things are really reliable, and then they're out doing stuff, and the earpiece breaks, and they don't know, and they're not hearing anything. They can transmit, but they can't hear. So where does that leave us? Now you now you don't know what's going on. Because you're trying to solve a problem of, I have to remember to turn my radio down when I get in the car, and turn it up when I get on the car. You're solving it with a doohickey that you don't need. Now there's other reasons to use earpieces, and some of them are very good. But if that's your reason, oh, I'm going to solve my problem with forgetting to turn the radio up and down with the earpiece, bad reason. Klaus Mulcher says, my favorite duty weapon is my Glock family because it has the perfect size just by switch the slide we can change the caliber. That's partially true. With the Glock pistol, by switching the top portion of the pistol, you can change between some calibers. There are components on the bottom portion of the pistol that change between 940 and 357 SIG. I'm sure that's the conversion that you're talking about. The ejector, I'm pretty sure, is different between 940 and 357. Maybe not 40 and 357, but I know between 9 and 40, the ejectors are different. So if you're going to do that exchange, it's not going to be just to train on the range with cheaper ammo. You need to change the ejector too in order to, to transfer them over. A little tidbit of knowledge. Most people don't know that. Also, you got to change the magazines out, but most people, I think, understand that. And the magazines between 40 and 357 are also slightly different, even though you'd think they'd be the same. CPT twist with little... Union Jack, little British flag on there, says, do all agencies over in the U.S. allow custom equipment? In my force in the U.K., we're only allowed to have what were issues. They're very strict on that. Well, in the United States, not everywhere allows custom equipment. There are some places where there's no reason to have custom equipment because they issue you the very best stuff you could possibly get. There's a town right near me, issues everybody brand new SIG P226s with awesome holsters for them, with lights on them. They give them great handcuffs, flashlights, everything, uniforms, and when they need something new, they just go with a voucher, basically, to the uniform shop and they get a new one. And that's great. Uh, some places, like where I work, provide us with very little. We get a vest, a radio, our badge, an ID card, commission card, things like that. But, like, the uniforms, the vest cover that you see, the external area of the vest, my duty pistol and mags, uh, flashlights, handcuffs, all of that, all that's on my dime. And when it's on my dime, the, the advantage of that is I get to set it up the way I want it, I get to accessorize it the way I want it. So if I don't like surefire weapon lights, I can use a streamlight weapon light. If I don't like a holster with a hood, I can use a holster with a snap. That's nice. Unfortunately, some agencies aren't really good about keeping up with making sure that 
they have a, a list of certified accessories. Yes, you can have this and a list of no, you cannot have that. And that's kind of the issue that we have in the United States with some places. You have to realize, unlike the UK that has universal rules that cover most of their agencies, in the United States, we've got thousands of police departments and every one of them can set their own policies within the framework of the law. So some places set very liberal policies. I had a place near me when I first started, I had a guy working and he had literally a six inch 44 mag that he was using as his duty pistol. Where he found a holster for it, I'll never know. And it was an oddball gun. It was like a Ruger 44 mag, six inch, and he was loading it with 44 specials. That's just what he carried. I have no idea where he found speed loaders for it, but he carried that around. Big blue gun, enormous. In fact, we have lock boxes in our courthouses if you're going to go into a secured facility. And he was the only one who was allowed to just carry his gun into the courthouse at the time, uh, past all the security and everything, because his gun wouldn't fit in the lockbox. So they had to make a special exception for him when he went like went in a lockup and stuff because couldn't fit him in the lockbox. They had to have somebody do whatever he had to do and bring the prisoner out to him. It was weird. Kyle Radigan says, why do you need to comp a 9mm? I don't need to comp a 9mm. Uh, some people feel that it helps them when they're using the high pressure, like plus, plus P plus uh, crazy spec ammo. They think it helps. I don't know. I've never really felt the need. But for them, if they think it helps, that's fine, as long as it doesn't detract from anything else. If it doesn't lower the reliability of the gun or anything, whatever. Whatever makes them happy. Uh, Texas Podhopper says, going to the police academy in June. I love my TLR2 HLG. Any advice on supplies to bring to the academy? Uh, no, not on supplies to bring to the academy. Bring what they tell you to bring, and that's it. That's all you need is to bring what they tell you to bring. What you want to do is don't think about what to bring. Think about how, what shape you should be in to go. So get in the best shape you possibly can. It's going to make the academy a lot easier than any doohickeys you could buy. Mr. Doverfield says, normal holster wear on a duty gun looks awesome. It certainly does. It's weird that that's become like the fashion trend on the internet is to have like duty worn pistol or like combat worn pistol where they spray paint it to look like it's worn. Or you could just go use your gun. That might work too. Then it'll look really cool. Dan says, I genuinely forget sometimes that I even have a weapon light. If I already have a flashlight in my hand, when I draw, I'll just end up going FBI style. I do a lot of the same thing because when I started, we didn't have weapon lights at all, so it wasn't a thing. Some guys have gotten to the point where they pull their gun out and part of their jaw stroke is turning that light on, which can also cause the little finger in the wrong place at the wrong time issues. So I have to be careful of that as well. Richard S. says, so no bayonets? No, no bayonets. <laughs> Uh, Smitty's Tree and Lawn Care asks about uh, red dots on duty weapons. I haven't really played one, played with one as a duty weapon. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of issues with the holster that's going on right now. Having holster that would protect that red dot, and that's kind of what keeps me from leaping into that arena at all. That and money, they're kind of expensive. Plus, you need a new holster and all of that to be able to do it. And I wouldn't be able to do it to my gun without sending it out to be milled or buying a new one, and I'm not made of money. Well, let's find something that's pertinent to this. Uh, Robert Stockham says, do you prefer using a weapon light or using a flashlight in your offhand? I prefer both. The, the weapon light does not replace at all having a separate flashlight. At all. These are two separate things. The weapon light is for use with just things that you're going to point the gun at. 
and it can be very useful for when you have to open doors and you want the light and the gun up where it's going to be at, or if you're handling a dog, or you're doing anything else with your other hand, to be able to have the light on the gun is nice. It is not a solution for a flashlight. When you're searching and all you need is to point light at something, you shouldn't be using your weapon light to search or your little LED on your taser to search. Yes, I've seen people do that before. Joseph Hershermeyer says, what do you think about the new 45 ACP Luger from Luger Man as a duty weapon? Is that, is that a, I think I saw a video from Forgotten Weapons on it. Is that the old school, like Luger toggle lock chambered in 45 ACP, like remade? I wouldn't go doing that. Plus you can't find leather for it, so that's not really helpful. Run G19 says, Surefire versus Streamlight thoughts. Whatever works for you. I've had Surefires. I've had a really great experience with them. I've had Streamlights. I've had a really great experience with them. I, I really have no dog in that fight. So whatever floats your boat, you can find holsters for both of them. Both of them work very well. People that say, this one's garbage, this one's good, this one's garbage, this one's good. Normally, they have some financial incentive to say that. I like them both, and I've used them both. David says, hey, I'm an auxiliary officer in Rosemont. Eh, I'm going up there later. Gaming with Zeke says, do you have a preference in concealed carry holsters and weapons? Uh, yeah, I like to carry them. <laughs> I got lots of holsters, lots of handguns. Uh, my Smith uh, 360 PD is pretty much my all the time. I carry it in a little Harry's holster, uh, Kydex holster, and most of the time because I'm lazy, and I can carry that all the time. And then if I can carry a larger gun, I carry a larger gun as well. Jabari Baini says, what you will do when three guys in front of you with guns and you don't have a gun replay? I don't know. Why would I not have one? Why would there be three people in front of me with guns? Would a three people in front of me with guns have anything to do with my safety? If you go to the mall, there's probably been times where you had three people in front of you with guns and you didn't even know it. John Smith says, how would you deal with an FTO or partner who is a wussy or not very confrontational? We don't necessarily have to be confrontational, but you can't run away from stuff and avoid things. And that has been a problem lately. You got to talk to them and make people understand that this, this isn't, if you've got a trainee that doesn't want to go hands-on or go talk to people, guess what? We're going to start marking that off. Like you can't just not touch people because you're not comfortable with it. Guess what? Police work isn't for you. Maybe you'd be a better accountant. Lil Baby Kenny says, I just had a Streamlight TLR HL fail on me the other day. Went to toggle it on and the whole battery cover fell off. Bad situation, a high stress moment. Those, some of those battery covers are hard to get on there properly, but it shouldn't be able to come off because it should be up against your trigger guard. Like when it's mounted on the gun, if it's mounted properly, it shouldn't be able to come off. If you have that, you have a problem with Streamlight. I sent mine back to Streamlight. Six years I had the thing, I think. Six years, it went to SWAT school. It fell off a tower. I mean, I, I beat on this thing. It was like the, out the surface of it. You can see it in old videos. It's all scratched up and destroyed. The lens is messed up. I sent it back to him because the little toggle switch on the bottom that went between the light being on, the laser being on, and both being on, and both being off, it, it wasn't working. It would only it would only stay on a couple of the positions. I sent it back to him, and it came back better than it than it started. And I still use it today. So and that was just a little switch problem. I've had mine for a long time, and it's still soldering on. I haven't any issues with it. But I do know that if you have any issues with your Streamlight, even stuff that they specifically say in their warranty they won't cover, if you say, "Hey, I, I'm a cop. I use this for duty use." Yada 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 yada, and you send it back to them, they'll fix it. But that's the only issue I've ever had with that one Streamlight. 
And that's a switching or a button issue. Every flashlight brand will have switching and button issues. They have a, they have a lifespan. It's a wear part. That's like buying a car and being like, oh, the, the pads on my car wore out. Well, yeah, they're going to. It's a wear part. But uh, the battery cover thing, that should never, ever happen. I would send that back to them. Either it wasn't hooked on properly or there's a defect in that part. That's the only way that could happen. Send it back to them. Sorry, trying to scroll through and find something that find something that's pertinent to the topic. Ethan Rifkind says, "I know that you use a laser. Uh, why do so many cops look down on it? I think a lot of people see it as a crutch, and if you're using it as a crutch to aim, there's a problem." The laser is not a crutch to aim. Just like anything else, you, you can cause problems using things the wrong way. You can't buy something and think it's going to be a magic solution. And I know some people buy things and think they're going to be a magic solution, and the laser is one of them. They think a laser sight is going to guide the bullets to the target. And when you get enough people who do that, then anybody that's using a laser, they go, oh, you can't use a laser. That's stupid. You know, It doesn't make you a better shooter. It's not supposed to make you a better shooter. It's supposed to do two things. One, it's a suspect management tool. And we all know, anybody that's ever used a taser knows the effect of the laser as a suspect management tool. And two, it helps you get a sight picture when you're in a weird position. Try aiming a pistol while holding a shield. Then try it with a laser. With a laser, it's significantly easier. Now, that wouldn't be my preferred thing to be doing, holding a pistol and trying to fire while holding a shield, but sometimes we get ourselves in situations where that's what we have to do, and having the laser is nice. Try shooting from under a car. You ever tried shooting from under a car? You go to class, use your iron sights. It's a little difficult, right? Try it with the laser. It makes it a little easier. Anything to make our life a little easier in those weird shooting positions can help. But you can't use it as a crutch. You can't just turn the laser on every time you draw the pistol, put the dot on the target, and pull the trigger and think you're going to hit, because that's not how it works. It's just like having sights. It's just like any other set of sights. You have to use it the right way. And I think the reason a lot of firearms instructors look down on lasers on duty weapons, and for good reason, is that the majority of people that are putting them on their gun are putting them on their gun in order to not have to aim. And they think it's going to... They think it's going to, like, laser guide their bullets to the target, and that's just not how they work. And so people spend a whole bunch of money on this thing that doesn't make them a better shooter. It's not meant to make you a better shooter. It's supposed to make shooting easier. Just like I always say, our, the things that we carry, the things that we buy, should be an augmentation to our skill sets, not a replacement for them. George Hitt has set, put uh, $5 in the tip jar for the donut fund and said, be safe. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. I will actually spend that on donuts. <laughs> Little Baby Kenny says, Weapon mounted light allows you to keep both hands on the gun as opposed to crossing under and holding your main light in one hand bracing your gun. Well, it makes it easier to be able to fire with both hands on the pistol the way you train to when you go to a class. So with a weapon mounted light, you keep both hands on the gun. Car's smaller now, sorry. You keep both hands on the gun. And you can turn the light on or off with like your thumb or your index finger, depending on the position and how you're going to do it. Right? But basically both hands can stay on the gun the way you normally would shoot. Now there's several different flashlight techniques. Uh, there's the syringe method where you brace them up against each other and you have the light between your fingers and you squeeze this hand in order to turn the light on. And there's another one that you've seen me do before with a mag light flashlight where you activate the light. You have the light sticking out here, the head of the light sticking out here, and you can activate the light with your uh, ring finger. 
and you put it around and brace against the gun like this and you can activate the light that way. The weapon model lake makes it a lot easier to shoot with a light on when you're in low light. That's their advantage. Ethan Rifkind says, why do you use the Glock 35? What's the reason for such a large gun? The Glock 35 is not a large gun. You take a Glock 35, you put it right next to a Glock 21, they're the same size. You take a Glock 35, you put it right next to any other 5-inch barrel duty weapon, Breda 92, 1911, any of that, they're the same size gun. The Glock 35 is a full-size duty pistol. The 22s and the 17s that are marketed as their full-size duty pistols, that is a compact. If you put it up against what 20 years ago would be a compact duty pistol, that's the size. And the 19 and 23s and all of that, those are just smaller sizes of the same gun. Glock 35 is not such a large gun, it just looks large compared to what most people are using in the concealed carry market and the cool guy market, which is a Glock 19, because they're shoving it down the front of their pants. You can't shove a Glock 35 down the front of your pants, just like I don't suggest shoving a 1911 or a full-size Breda 92 down the front of your pants. But if you're going to use this as a duty gun, it's going in a holster on the outside of your belt, what is the purpose of making that thing smaller? You know, what's what's the purpose of making that smaller? There, It's the same weight as a Glock 22 or a Glock 17. It carries the same capacity, and it's easier to hit with. What, what's the downside? It's an inch longer? Great. An inch more sight radius. So it's easier to be accurate with. Isn't that the whole idea is to, to hit what you're aiming at? Like, why else are you carrying a gun? The Kings are OP has continually said, free field training, can I have a shout out? The Kings are OP. I don't know who the Kings are OP is, but there's his shout out. Patrick Lachelle says, could you carry a revolver if you wanted to? I carry a revolver all the time uh, as my backup gun and as my off-duty piece. Uh, on, on duty, I could not because my department, I think they said after 1994, if you got hired after 94, you had to carry a semi-automatic. And once you converted from a revolver to semi-automatic, you had to continue carrying a semi-automatic as your duty weapon. So no, I couldn't as a cop. For security, I could. Generally, I don't, but I could. I only carry a revolver as a duty weapon for security, like if I'm working a side gig, if they require that or they prefer that at the site. Mac tonight says, police where I live, EU, still carry without a round in the chamber. I'm sure they do. There's some countries in, in Europe that have really weird rules for really stupid reasons. Whatever. Not my gig. I don't work there. TF2 Fail says, do you think suppressors are viable for duty use? Uh, currently, because of their form factor, basically because of their size and weight, no. Uh, and the reliability issues that they can cause with some handguns, no. I don't think they are. I think at some point, we're going to see them integrated into handguns. You're going to see a integrally suppressed, legitimately integrally suppressed, not what you're seeing out there now. I know there's there's one that's supposedly integrally suppressed. It's huge. The thing is enormous. You think my gun's big? Huge. You would, you could never carry that around, even as a duty pistol. And you're, you, haven't, you don't see holsters that will allow you to carry a suppressor. Now, part of the reason I think that that's not going to happen isn't just the size and the weight. It's that I don't think companies are going to make suppressors that are small enough to just mount on a duty gun and fit into a normal holster that, you know, wouldn't cause an issue. Like, you could take a Glock 19 size pistol, put a very small suppressor on it, and be able to use that fairly easily. I think the problem is that companies are going to want to say, because they're worried about liability, it's the big issue we always bring up here, they're worried about the liability of creating something that's not hearing safe. To say, well, it's safer, but it's not hearing safe. They're not going to do that. I think that's what's basically holding suppressor technology back for duty use. That and the legalities of it. Every cop, you'd have to have a tax stamp for everyone. Places like here, the agency would have to own it, and that kind of holds us back. But I think 
liability is what really holds that back is companies don't want to make something and say, no, it's a suppressor, but it's not hearing safe. Ref says, would you ever carry a concealed carry weapon like a Glock 26 as a full-time duty weapon? If not, why? No, a sight radius is really small. Uh, you're giving up capacity and not getting anything as a result. I mean, you're putting it in a holster on the outside of your belt. There's no reason to go that small. Gadson Jim says, I thought I heard that Safari Land came out with a duty holster for Glocks with red dots that protects the dot housing. I haven't seen them actually on the market for sale yet, and I haven't played with one, so I can't give you an opinion on it. I have seen that, though. The original ones were only in, like, camouflage. Let's scroll down and see if we can find something that's pertinent to the topic here. We've got 118 people on here watching and commenting. I'm trying to find stuff that makes sense to, to talk about. A lot of people are asking about strobe lights for disorienting and blinding a suspect or mounting them on a duty gun. I have a video on that. It's called Light as a Weapon. It made some people very angry, but that's what I think about it. It's it's up there. I, I'll link it if I think about it, but uh, it's on there. It's called uh, Light as a Weapon, and it's got a picture of me with a light blinding into the, into the camera. So I'll answer all those questions by saying there's another video on that. Joseph says, is shooting around a ballistic shield practical? I've got no experience with them, but if you have it out, there's probably a bunch of guys around you with rifles anyway, right? Most of the time, and that is the preferred method to use is a ballistic shield. Uh, hopefully I get a hold of a ballistic shield, find some company that wants me to shoot at one or something, and we can, we can show you, but ballistic shield, if you're the guy holding the shield, you normally want to just be holding the shield. There's a lot of techniques where you can shoot from around the shield, like looking through the viewport, and put your gun in front of the the shield it's a lot easier to do that if you have a laser because then you're not worried about putting it in front of the viewport you can put it to the side and just put the laser on the target i will tell you it's a lot easier to limp wrist like that and end up locking up your gun uh, where people get themselves in a situation where they're doing that is things happen you're the shield guy you're holding the shield there's guys with rifles on either side of you with muzzles ahead of the shield and they're doing whatever they're doing and weird things happen and you up, end up standing there with nobody next to you holding a shield and now you're trying to make the best of the situation. Or you're the patrolman who's assigned that shield. That shield's going to be in your car or your truck. You pull it out to use, and you don't have a whole bunch of people with rifles around you yet. And it's hard to shoot as the second man in the stack with a pistol around his shield. If you've ever tried that, you know how difficult that one is. And not everybody's trained up on it, and you don't want to get deafened. So maybe if you're the shield guy, and that's your tool that you bring to the fight, you may be stuck you know, with pistol out around the shield for a while until you get more help with you, especially help that has rifles. It can happen. It isn't my preferred way of using it. William Setatar put $5 in the donut fund. Thank you, William. And he says, did you ever see that laser or maybe a light that was at SHOT Show some years ago. It was activated by the trigger, a really dangerous system. <laughs> so when you take the, I did see something like that. When you take the slack out of the trigger, the laser comes on so that you can verify that you're on site. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> Maybe there's some technique to it. It allows you to use it safely, and I'm sure the company has some idea of why they wanted it to work that way, but I wouldn't put that on anything that I owned. That seems like a terrible idea. At the point you're you're touching that trigger, the decision to shoot should already be made. Uh, Mason Melody says, body armor for unarmed security? Question mark. Yes, exclamation point. 
if it was King Tommy land and I was making the rules, everyone that worked security in some way would be required to wear body armor. So in order to, to keep that license for the security company, all their people would have to wear body armor and have radios. If they're working a site with more than two people, body armor and a radio, that's it. That's That would be how I would make the rules. Because I think having that body armor is that important. Because people get hurt and killed and wouldn't get hurt and killed as much if they were wearing body armor. And I think having to spend that kind of money on security for a company where they had to provide people with body armor might make people a little more serious about training, you know, like teaching people the right way to do things. If they couldn't just put some dude in blue jeans, give him a t-shirt, black t-shirt and white that says security in white letters and stand them in front of a store. Because that's, that's a major problem with the security industry is they just all the way to the bottom of the market. Just find the dumbest person you possibly can, give them a t-shirt and send them on their way. And if there were some standards, maybe the standards would be a little better. C4 Defense says, I've got a, 40, a G41, 45 ACP version of the G35, and love it. It's not too big. I was thinking about getting into those, but I'd have to cross over to 45 ACP, and we're changing over ammo. i got to see how the ammo thing shakes out. Warrior Worries says... Uh, Patrick, at Patrick, I'm actually considering getting that vest. We're talking about the Safe Life Defense vest. It was sponsored in his video. They don't pay me anything at all. Safe Life Defense just sends me stuff to destroy. Um, free field training, what's your honest opinion about the vest? What you see in the video is my honest opinion, and that's why I started putting up on Facebook the unedited versions of those videos so that you can see we're not gaming it. I took the vest. I put it up. I shot the crap out of it. I got tased wearing it. All that stuff is real. There isn't special ammo that I'm using. I'm not using special guns. If I wanted to, I could, and I don't. And when companies tell me, I want to send you one of my vests to test, I show them the video and I go, realize this is what I'm going to do to it, and it's, this is not gamed. This is legitimately what you're seeing is what you're getting. We are really shooting this thing with the real rounds and the real guns that you're seeing. And almost all of them back out. <laughs> so that should tell you something. They are, right now, the most protective vest that I've seen. I've shot 3A vests before with 12 gauge slugs. Most of the time they'll stop one, they definitely don't stop four or five. One ounce slugs. And Safe Life Defense is making a vest that stops it. And if I was going to have to buy my own vest and I was going to wear it in an external carrier, I would get the 3A plus. No doubt. I wish my work would let me use it for work. I would. Without hesitation. Arwin Bernard says, hey, I can't use laser sights. I've been shooting since I was 6, 33 now. My instructor in boot camp, Marines, insisted everyone stick to to the iron sights because you don't have to clean them or check batteries, LOL. Well, you do have to clean them. Iron sights do need to be cleaned in order to work properly. Uh, the iron sights on rifles, you have to take a match to every once in a while, keep them black. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. Same thing with handgun sights. You use metal handgun sights. You use them enough, and you start wearing away at the, the back area of it, and you have to re-blacken the sights. There is maintenance involved in, in iron sights, even. But you don't have to replace batteries, and that's, yeah, that's great. There's At a certain point with police work, I can tell you for sure, I carry so much battery-powered equipment that if I was worried about replacing batteries, I would never be able to get anything done with the gear that I have. I have to replace the batteries on my radio, three flashlights, the light on my gun, everything has batteries. And so adding another battery-powered thing, especially with the battery life of them now, like the red dot that I have on my rifle, it has a three-year battery life. So every year, I change the battery, and then it never gets anywhere close. So as we get runtime gets better on lasers and on red dots, it becomes less and less of an issue of having to worry about the battery life. And right now on lasers and red dots, if you get a good quality brand, there's no issue with battery life. <laughs> Matthew Guerin says, who assigns a special police units like Camaro SS and Charger RTS 
see it on cops all the time. You see it on cops because that's not real life. <laughs> Agencies are trying to put their best foot forward. This being like, I went to this community policing event and they had a race car for a police car. Well, that's, that's just what? Nobody drives that. <laughs> that thing sits in a garage somewhere or in a trailer somewhere. RC put $10 in the donut fund. Thank you, RC. And says, going into the police academy in June when I'm 21 and having our first child in July. Ooh, that's rough. Your wife's going to hate you. It's going to be an interesting summer. I love your content and I reaffirm, and it's reaffirmed my decision to become a Leo. Thank you very much, RC. And thank you for the donut money. I appreciate it. It's RC. Oop, missed the cup holder. New car. John Smith says, what's the crappiest thing a law enforcement agency has given you for actual use? That is a very good question, and I think I'm going to screenshot that, and we're going to do a live stream just on that, because that could make a whole video all its own. And uh, I'm going to have to cut it, because my wife's waiting on me, and uh, she's got a honey-do list for me to do this Sunday, because I'm actually off. So uh, until next week, you guys be safe, and take care of each other.